What's up students, this is Mr. Sagers back again with another video for Earth and Space Science. Today's topic is the life cycle of stars. By the end of this video, you should be able to compare the life cycles of stars of different masses, as well as be able to understand how stars forge different elements through nuclear fusion. Let's get to it. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. It's a simple song we all sing as kids, and if you've ever wondered what a star is, you're not alone. For millennia, stars have been worshipped, they've been seen as omens of bad things to come, and they've been used by sailors to chart courses across the oceans. The ancients mapped out constellations, grouping stars together by shapes they perceived in the night sky. We still use the names of many of these constellations today. For example, you may have heard of the constellation Orion, the Great Hunter, Ursa Major, the Great Bear, and Taurus, the Bull. Some of the more prominent stars have even been given names. You may have heard of Betelgeuse, Bellatrix, or Rigel. But it wasn't until the birth of modern astronomy that scientists first discovered stars' true significance in the cosmos. Stars provide more than twinkling light in the sky and a habitable orbit for our planet. Stars are the cosmic blacksmiths out of which everything around us has been forged. In fact, if it wasn't for stars, we wouldn't exist. All stars are born in the same cosmic nursery. Stars are formed out of interstellar nebulae. The word nebulae is the plural form of nebula, a Latin word meaning cloud. Interstellar nebulae, or interstellar clouds, are made primarily of cold hydrogen and helium gases left over from the Big Bang. They may also contain dust and fragments of elements formed from the death of earlier stars. These clouds of gas and dust swirl throughout the universe, but are mostly concentrated in galaxies where the force of gravity pulls them together in swirling masses. If the force of gravity is concentrated enough at any point within one of these nebulae, the gases begin to collapse and grow in mass as matter starts to accumulate. This further concentrates the pull of gravity, causing even more of the surrounding gaseous matter to fall into the growing star. As matter contracts, it heats up. The gravitational contraction causes atoms in the gas cloud to move faster and faster, violently bumping into each other. Eventually, temperatures become so great that electrons are stripped away from their nuclei, and the gas changes its state into a hot plasma. Once the center, or core of the star, reaches approximately one million degrees, the atomic nuclei collide with such energy that the nuclear engine of the star turns on. Through a series of reactions, four hydrogen atoms fuse to form a helium atom. This process of nuclear fusion releases tremendous amounts of visible light and heat energy, and at last, a star is born. Stars maintain a delicate balance between opposing forces. On the one hand, the pull of gravity, and on the other hand, the energy produced from nuclear fusion. The force of gravity pulls the star's matter towards its core, the heat and pressure that result from this gravitational pull power the process of nuclear fusion in the star's center. Nuclear fusion, in turn, produces a force that pushes the star back outward and counteracts the inward pull of gravity. A star is said to have achieved hydrostatic equilibrium when these forces are balanced. As long as hydrostatic equilibrium can be maintained, neither the inward pull of gravity nor the outward push of nuclear fusion will overpower the other, and the star will continue to live out its life relatively undisturbed. In the end, however, only one of these forces can prevail. The ultimate conqueror turns out to be gravity. Once the gravitational pull of the star overcomes the outward force of nuclear fusion, equilibrium is lost and the star begins to die. Whether the star ends with a bang or with a whimper, however, depends entirely on the star's size. Perhaps the most defining characteristic of a star is its mass. The mass of a star is simply a measurement of how much matter it contains. Stars like our sun are average, or low-mass stars. Low-mass stars live long and relatively quiet lives, characterized by five general stages. Protostar, main sequence, red giant, planetary nebula, and white dwarf. During the protostar stage, the star is born as a result of the collapse of an interstellar cloud. The protostar stage may last for millions of years as matter continues to accumulate around the star, and its temperature increases. In the main sequence stage, the star's nuclear furnace is turned on as hydrogen fuses into helium and the star shines visible light. 
Low-mass stars spend the majority of their lives in the main sequence stage, which can last anywhere from billions to trillions of years. Eventually, a star's nuclear fuel begins to run out. When all of a low-mass star's available hydrogen has been fused to helium, the star begins to swell into its red giant stage. During this stage, the star grows hundreds of times in size and temperature. The added temperature allows the star to begin fusing its helium into the element carbon. Because the star's energy is sent through a much larger surface area, the surface changes from white-hot to a cooler red appearance. After the fusion of carbon, low-mass stars do not possess the mass or gravity to facilitate the fusion of any heavier elements. During the planetary nebula stage, the star begins to die. As nuclear fusion runs out of fuel, gravity takes over once more and the star collapses. Some of the gaseous atmosphere of the star escapes the gravitational collapse due to energy that pulses outward from the falling star. These escaping gas clouds form planetary nebulae, which have nothing to do with actual planets, and form some of the most spectacular astronomical sites observed. After the end of nuclear fusion, the low-mass star can no longer support itself. Gravity collapses the remaining matter down to about the size of Earth. The star will glow white hot due to any leftover energy from its long life cycle. The resulting white dwarf star will continue to cool and will dim into darkness over trillions of years. This is how the sun and many of the stars that we see in the sky will ultimately complete their lives. So much for low mass stars, but what about high mass stars? The life cycle of high mass stars also follows five general stages. Protostar, main sequence, red or blue supergiant, supernova, and neutron star or black hole. High mass stars are much larger and generally much, much brighter than low mass stars. The lifespan of high mass stars also tends to be much shorter than the lifespan of low mass stars because high mass stars burn through their nuclear fuel at a much faster rate. The protostar stage of the formation of a high mass star is relatively similar to the formation of a low mass star. The primary difference is that high mass stars form into much more massive objects and therefore exert a greater gravitational force on the nebular clouds surrounding them. Once the hydrogen fusion commences in a high-mass star's core, it has entered the main sequence stage. High-mass stars tend to appear either white or blue depending on their temperature and burn much more brightly than cooler yellow and red low-mass stars. Due to their massive gravitational pressure, high-mass stars burn through their nuclear fuel at a much faster rate than low-mass stars. Once hydrogen fuses to helium, carbon fusion begins. Unlike low-mass stars, however, high-mass stars are so massive that they have enough gravitational pressure to fuse even heavier elements. After all of the star's helium has been fused to carbon, then some of the carbon fuses to form oxygen. A similar process happens afterward to fuse neon and so forth. Given enough gravitational pressure, high-mass stars are capable of forming all of the elements on the periodic table up to and including iron. This process happens much more quickly in high-mass stars, whose main sequence may only last from tens of thousands to a few million years. Similar to low-mass stars, high-mass stars swell and expand as they begin to fuse heavier and heavier elements. Due to their massive size, they are termed red or blue supergiants, depending on the color of light they emit during the stage. The supergiant stage ends when its gravitational pressure is no longer strong enough to fuse any elements heavier than iron. Perhaps the most spectacular phenomenon in all of astronomy is the supernova stage of a dying high-mass star. A supernova only occurs in high-mass stars and is triggered when the star can no longer fuse elements heavier than iron. At that point, the star collapses in upon itself. Rapidly collapsing matter rebounds off the star's core at a velocity near the speed of light and is jettisoned in a vibrant display out into space. A supernova explosion is so violent that during the brief moments in which it occurs, elements heavier than iron can be formed. These include elements such as gold, silver, copper, and all of the other elements up to plutonium on the periodic table. After a supernova, a high-mass star faces one of two fates. It may either become a neutron star, or if its mass is great enough, it can become a black hole. Neutron stars, as the name suggests, are the remnants of high-mass stars and are made primarily of neutrons. During a supernova, Immense gravitational pressure causes the electrons and protons of atoms to collide. As this occurs, their charges cancel and they become neutrons. Because neutrons have no charge, they can no longer repel each other and are free to condense even further under the force of gravity. The neutron star collapses to an unbelievably dense state, approximately 10 miles in diameter, about the size of New York City. 
The density of the remnant matter is such that one teaspoonful of a neutron star would weigh billions of tons on Earth. The neutron star will live out the remainder of its life much like a white dwarf, slowly cooling and dimming over trillions of years. Neutron stars have been known to collide. When this happens, the merging of the two stars results in a cataclysmic explosion that jettisons even more heavy elements out into space. Black holes result when high mass stars are so massive and collapsing matter becomes so dense that the fabric of space can no longer hold the collapsing star's matter. Once a star reaches this point, called its critical mass, gravity is in complete control. No one knows for sure what you would find inside a black hole, but it is thought that every atom of matter is condensed to an infinitely small point called a singularity, a place where the curvature of space-time becomes infinite. The curved ring of light that appears around the edges of black holes is known as the event horizon, and is actually light from behind the black hole that has been curved due to the immense pull of gravity. Nothing that crosses into the event horizon can escape a black hole, not even light. As we conclude our discussion on the life cycle of stars, it is important to realize that without stars, the universe would not have the abundance of different elements that we have today. Were it not for stars, the only building blocks we'd have to create matter would be hydrogen and helium, leftovers from the Big Bang. This periodic table demonstrates how stars produce all of the complex atoms in the universe. The elements in blue were produced from the Big Bang. In green are elements produced through fusion in low-mass stars. The elements in yellow are produced through fusion in high-mass stars. And finally, all of the elements in purple are produced either in supernovae explosions or as the result of the collision of neutron stars. It's pretty impressive to realize that practically everything you own, the tissues that make up your body, the metals inside your phone, and even the air you breathe were all forged in the nuclear furnace of stars. So to recap, stars are born in interstellar nurseries called interstellar nebulae, or interstellar clouds. Stars are produced through the process of nuclear fusion. Low-mass stars fuse elements up to carbon, live very long lives, and die as white dwarves. High-mass stars fuse elements up to iron, live shorter lives than low-mass stars, produce heavier elements when they reach supernova stage, and die either as neutron stars or black holes. The abundance and variety of elements in the universe is a direct result of stellar nucleosynthesis, or fusion in stars. So that wraps up our video on the life cycle of stars. I hope you enjoyed it and look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, Ad Astra.